Well, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Audrey Grabesic. My company is Modular SureSight. I'm a modular consultant for residential and commercial projects and OffsiteDirt.com is our media arm. And it's very exciting because on our offsite construction series for this month, we are featuring Tim Seams. He's with John Burns Real Estate Consulting. And the topic that we're going to be discussing today is build to rent research. And I have my co-partner here with me, Scott Higgins. Hello, Scott. Hello, Audrey. And hello, Tim. Um, and thanks for those of you who are joining us today. As Audrey said, feel free to put your um, information, LinkedIn, company profile, what have you in the chat. Um, the point of this is to hear um, all this great wisdom from Tim, but also for all of us to connect. Um, so we look forward to hearing what Tim has to talk about today. Tim is one of my dear friends. I met him a couple of years ago at the International Builder Show, and he's always one of my, my favorite people to talk to. He is connected with so many different individuals in the offsite industry and construction industry. So Super excited to have him. Um, Tim, we're going to have you take it away. We're very excited you're here today, Tim. Thanks. I am uh, I'm stoked to be here myself, and I'm glad for everyone that's joined and those who are watching the recording. And uh, thank you, Scott and Audrey, for having me. And it has been a couple wild years since we first met, right, right uh, Audrey? It's, it's been uh, pretty crazy. One thing that hasn't changed, though, is what we're going to talk about today. And I'll go ahead and share that here. Um, hopefully you can see this. Everyone good? All yes, right. you can see it. So um, we're here with Offsite Dirt today uh, to, to share what we've learned um, about the build for rent space and connect, just like we connect people in the industry, connect that with offsite construction. Is there even a connection? We'll talk about that. And we've been working in the, uh, the build for rent space since just after the great financial crisis. And uh, uh, as few people, Rick and Don at our company specifically, uh, saw a trend happening and it happened very quickly with the distressed homes and uh, firms like BlackRock and other uh, institutional money, as well as private small investors, gobbled up, for, for lack of a better term, uh, they, they distressed properties, a lot of single family, huge, not just a couple hundred, but thousands at, the time, at a time, and turned them into single family rentals for families that needed them, couples and people in transition in their life, or even just want to live there for a long time. So we'll share a little bit about that. So since then, we've really gained a name for ourselves um, uh, and spoken a lot of events and presented this information and grown the research uh, part of the business for off the shelf, as well as feasibility studies for uh, build for rent single family. And we do a lot with apartments, but we're going to mostly focus on uh, horizontal today. So um, a few things that are different about single family build for rent or build to rent or single family rentals, however, whatever acronym you want to use, uh, SFR, BTR, BFR, no matter how you cut it, it's different. And the way it's different a lot of times comes down to the capital stack. It comes down to the fee structure. It comes down to the construction methods. And there are some other kind of other layers that we're seeing really pressed into this space that before were kind of, well, nice to haves. Now they're really need to haves. Uh, but the basics are uh, different than single family for sale new construction. Single family build for rent new construction has a long time horizon compared to other portfolios. You might have with multifamily, say, a five to seven year business plan. Often the disposition happens within three years. Uh, so that, that's much different than a single family build for rent community that might have a 10 to 20 year time horizon. Um, they have patient yield requirements. And they invest more into these durable materials because they're going to be holding these properties for longer periods. And they aren't so worried about this affecting the comps because they don't answer to a for sale appraiser where someone has to qualify for this property in the traditional sense, like we're used to a single family. So they have some flexibility in the modality, the mode of construction, and the materiality, uh, the, the materials they use. There's another component to this that's really 
uh, we, we've seen it in other sectors like with Exxon and so forth, but where there's so much pressure from investors to really execute on the ESG strategies that, um, that folks have had in their uh, governance documents for some time, but haven't necessarily executed on them well or executed on them all at all. They're getting the pressure on these um, portfolios. Many investments, this is a key point, they're coming from, um, they're coming from renter nations. These investors, that they're used to uh, uh, propensity of the renter versus the buyer of homes. And so they come in the U.S. with those optics, and it does affect how they look at investments. And then there, there are, uh, is a buildup of these huge and sustainable portfolios, not just buying 10 homes from D.R. Horton or, or um, you know, a builder in Florida or something like that. They're building out these, these large communities and they want to hold them for a long, long time. So sustainability in many respects um, are affecting how they look at materials and modes of construction. So we've seen, this is just from our, our most recent client webinar last week, um, that the apartment sector, yes, it is blazing hot. I mean, you, you haven't had this kind of occupancy in ages. Um, and then the effective rents are up 15% year over year as of October. So this is, this is a huge deal. But let's look at some of the single family. So when we look at the single family, um, the rent index and where the hot markets are, pretty much all, all these markets are hot. And, and they are in the first market too. But you see with uh, the comparison of year over year of rent, the rent index change. Now that's not rents. That's not effective rents. That is the rent index changes. Those are growing in the double digits in some markets. So this is, you can see why this is uh, very lucrative. I'm going to go off camera because it looks like I am, um, like I am a little unstable just in the internet though. Not, not mentally, hopefully. So, so the, so um, let's look at, so that's giving you, showing you the hot market. So you can see why it is a big investment for, uh, for people uh, looking at this space and looking for a place like, where do I put my money? I can only buy so much art and bourbon and apartment buildings, right? So uh, where am I going to put in my investment? So we, look, we saw the effective rents of the apartments. Right. So here's invitation homes. We we have an entire team that all they do is listen to building product manufacturers, lumber and building materials, for sale builders, hedge funds, equity. They they listen to everyone plus single family build for rent, uh, and they data and they get summaries. And so the um, here you can see what single family bill for rent for invitation homes is garnering in new leases increases. I mean, it's huge. The renewals are pretty high. I mean, that's ridiculously high. But the new leases uh, that come in, they're just almost 20% uh, increases. So uh, you, again, when you look through the financials uh, that they post, it's just uh, every market is just chains for Asian homes and not that different for Tricon. And uh, they're seen in all these markets they operate in just crazy, almost 30% increases, over 30% in Las Vegas increase in rent growth when they sign a new lease. And then the renewals, they're by themselves are strong in their own right. Um, American homes for rent, they're seeing exactly the same thing. You can see why this is an important space thing as industry in 10 years you didn't have people talking about this. Now, the only people not talking about single family built for rent portfolio, portfolios are um, your everyday uh, Joes and Janes. And as soon as we start to hear about the, the barber and, and uh, the Uber driver talking about portfolio buying and single family built for rent, we'll know we've kind of probably reached a tipping point, but we're not there yet. Yeah. So you can see, again, they post their uh, average change in releases. So that's not the only thing. That's a, that's a finished product, right? Who's buying the land? Well, if you see in the purple in this bar,
since uh, Q4 of last year of raw land. We just hadn't seen that in the past. So this is um, ri kind of ridiculous. So it's over double what it was Q4 last year. So in those four quarters, you can see quite a bit of growth. And then you see these quotes, the Phoenix land brokers say speculators in the build for rent space, they're tying properties up. Um, and then going through the property that you can see that increase, especially in the Southwest. We asked in our survey, our land survey, that quarterly, uh, have build for rent operators been outbidding builders for lots or land deals? And uh, quite a few said yes. You can see that in the blue, right? They're getting outbid for, for sale uh, lots by build for rent buyers. So this is not a small kind of niche thing anymore. Tons of money pouring in this space at all levels, the finished product, as well as the raw land. So we're uh, finding that this, this came out of our new home trends, it went out to clients a couple of months ago. Um, our new home trends does a lot of um, consumer research of the end user. And this came out of the, the master plan community hit and build for rent parcels, not just one or two, but entire parcels in a master plan community that's fully amenitized. This, that is really a thing now. And so all these different builders, they may even build for sale and for rent in their own part of the community. And then there are giant chunks of just invitation homes or just Brookfield or, and, and several others. So it's really uh, becoming more, more ubiquitous and a, an established um, strategy. So you, a lot of you probably heard about these uh, deals, these land deals, but uh, we're a deal because they historically have been doing dedicated for sale uh, communities. And then there was this deal that went down in mid-October for 37,000 acres. And here's in the perspective, near-term plan supporting the single family rental, family rentals. So that's a long-term plan, 20 years, lines up with how the portfolios uh, uh, managers operate and what the deals they're looking for. So you can see where the land, the consumers, the master plan developers, all of them are lining up well to, um, to take advantage of this, uh, de this demand. So if everyone's building all this and developing all this, are we going to have a bubble in a few years? Well, we also do, uh, we also do a lot of demographic research for our clients. So here we ask, okay, single family renters, what's their pre preference to own or rent by life stage? Prefer to rent is orange. That is a bigger chunk than almost anyone realizes by the time they see this chart. And uh, it's usually gets a lot of like blinking eyes and, um, and open mouths, just like what is going on? So much demand. We don't see this going away, especially considering the kind of money that's coming in to support it. And then what, what is the uh, price range? Pretty high price range is different than apartments. So uh, this supports those numbers that we saw earlier. And then how long do people uh, plan to stay? The duration is longer also than attached product. So roughly uh, those who prefer to rent wanna stay in their homes longer. Um, you can see that in the blue, five years, but I plan to move eventually. So um, it's a pretty substantial slice uh, and cohort. So these are the markets we report on. We're adding 30 more markets next year. So it's a lot of fun for us to work on this um, because it's been developing and it's just, we see it continuing to um, be a part of the housing story in the United States. But what are the headwinds? It's no different than anybody else. Okay, this is from our dealer survey. Dealers expect 7 to 9% price increases across all product, product categories in 2022. So this is one of the headwinds everyone's facing. It. Single family rental is not immune from it. Then we see the dealers say, oh, they answer for both what they hear from their customer and the lumberyards also answer for themselves. So 
you know, what's the top concern? Labor is the top concern for both the, their customer and themselves across the board. So we started to see this pretty interesting uh, build for rent job postings on LinkedIn and Indeed. What's really interesting, the one on the right are the job postings. There's actually, if you look at um, some of the data, there's over 2,000, there are over 2,000 jobs for build for rent job postings all the way from foreman to, to um, portfolio manager and, and um, everything in between. But then what's interesting is you see Main Street Renewal. They are a built for rent. They're in the built for rent space as an operator. But there you see they're looking for a director for factory development. So it's, we're starting to bridge that between built for rent and modular. So this is where we start talking about that conversation. How do we deal with the headwinds? Well, built for rent may be best positioned to take advantage of building technologies uh, quicker um, at, than for sale product. So then we have specific modular job postings that you see that same job posting I mentioned earlier from Main Street on the left. And then you see even building product manufacturers are hiring people just to, just to work on offsite construction products. And in that channel, it's a completely different channel than your typical go-to-market for building product manufacturers and the lumber and building materials industry which we spend a lot of time on. That's I, one of my main things I do is I work on the survey work in the lumber and building materials uh, to gain that intelligence. So what about building product manager? We saw that Simpson strong tie job posting. What about building product manufacturer job postings for build for rent? Uh, because you can see it's a strong um, order, uh, like the order strength for single family rental is strong based on the survey. Dealers know that these folks are coming in and buying from them and they rate them as very strong. So where are the building product manufacturer specialists that are calling on build for rent? I could find no job posting for someone from the BPM space for build for rent. So that's an opportunity. One threat uh, to building to uh, uh, build for rent or BTR, SFR, this was in our October client webinar. So just a few weeks ago, uh, John Burns was talking about the likelihood that GSEs would be increasing loan limits for single family. Well, they also, you know, they do loan limits for, uh, for conforming loans for single family, two unit, three unit, four unit. And uh, it's been hanging out like uh, around uh, 550,500 uh, the last couple of years. And so we were thinking it would go up to about 650. Well, just today, it was announced the conforming loan limits, some of them for single family residents up to a million dollars in these areas that are highlighted. And then everywhere in the country, the loan limit uh, went up to almost 650 grand. So this changes things because uh, with, with mortgage rates where they are, I mean, it could change things. It doesn't necessarily change things because everything's so strong right now. But if things were to normalize a little bit, it could threaten BFR uh, uh, demand a little bit if people found it easier to get into uh, single family homes and not have to get a jumbo loan. So this does lower that barrier a little, but everyone is facing huge demand right now. So we're not really seeing it, excuse me, being a, a, a concern for some time. Now, a lot of those uh, loan limits came in the hottest for sale markets in the U.S. You can see Salt Lake, super hot, Las Vegas, um, Seattle, you, the loan limits were increased a lot, Southern California. So those are coming in the hottest for sale markets, those loan limits. But these are also hot build for rent markets. So there is some competition. You saw the competition in land. You see the competition in the finished product for that consumer to rent or buy. So it's not like a slam dunk, although everyone seems to be posting pretty awesome numbers right now. So just to give you a look at the client dashboard to, get, to give you an idea of the things that, that the uh, fund managers, portfolio managers, investors look at um, in our research is that they come in and a lot of times they're like, okay, what market should I go into? So they look at the market ranking. And, and they compare that with what their underwriting needs to be through all these different tabs. And that helps them identify markets or maybe there's a disposition in the works and so forth. So 
Um, it just, what we're trying to do is be a resource out there for the community uh, on many levels. And one of them is for the in, uh, institutional investors. But building blocks, um, basically every value chain is in array. I mean, this is basically what's been happening this decade, um, any which way but loose, right? Uh, like that 70s movie. But, um, but they're, they're, we're not left without options. And these headwinds aren't new. Some new friendships are forming to combat these headwinds. So you see, uh, we saw Lennar playing the spin off. They got four billion homes. Okay, that's huge. Now four billion, four hundred, four billion dollars doesn't go that far actually, but it gives you an idea of the amount of money coming into that space. Lennar, I'm just giving you an idea of how some of these new applications, new partnerships are coming to play in this market to help answer some of the labor challenges, supply chain challenges, more of a bandwidth of uh, trade partners and suppliers. So Lennar and Vive, uh, they have a partnership for, for the modular uh, and prefabricated products that uh, Vive is involved in and will be involved in. Okay, Lennar um, and Bark Bar uh, group and Icon Builds are collaborating on this 100 homes. These are all going to be ostensibly for sale, but that hasn't actually been finalized yet. But it just gives you an idea of what's going on. So if these aren't for rent products, they're competing with products. Um, and so that they're something that needs to be looked at. So speaking of uh, Bjark, Bjark Ingels, Bjark, uh, I think is how I'm supposed to pronounce it. Um, the, and Mark Laurie, and a bunch of money is going in to build the city of Tolosa. The city of Tolosa is a, um, no one, well, I don't know, I'm sure someone knows where it is, but basically they're looking for a site that has 100, 150,000 acres to house 5 million people to build a new city a new sustainable city. So this is a pretty big deal to start to be made. And you can see why Lennar wants to integrate all these different companies together and partnerships to uh, make sure that uh, they're hedging their labor challenges and supply chain challenges so they can meet their, execute their goals. And um, why are they doing this? Well, when you look at the market path, it is, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of layers, and folks are just trying to knock out a few of those layers. This is my good buddy, Mark Mitchells. This is his commercial building materials map to market. Um, this is something that uh, John and the marketing team worked on a few years ago, uh, a developer board game, show all the little things that have to go right, uh, but likely don't, just to get to the point where you're digging for the foundation. So there's so many of those things. That's why uh, companies like Polari Group uh, has uh, made a deal with one of our clients, Mighty Buildings, to build these homes in Southern California. They're all 3D printed homes. And then there's this huge project uh, that's getting a lot of support, Utah Lake Restoration for thousands and thousands of rent is a thing in the rest of the United States. It's not gonna not be a thing in this community as it gets built out over the years. So there's there are all these, um, these kind of demand signals, these pipeline signals, and there are even some catalysts along the way that could push uh, innovation in modular offsite prefab even further. There's something that was announced this last week as well. The new ASTM standards for offsite construction, thanks to ICC and the Modular Building Institute. So we can have some standards for construction across the United States. Now, how that will be adopted and mandated will be just as any other code adoption across the United States. Everyone does it. But this gives, gives some impetus behind the building technologies. And since the build for rent space has such different optics and timelines and uh, capital stack, they can actually do something with this quicker. Will they? I don't know, because uh, 
uh, some there are some things to think about. Bill, it sounds rosy, but if Bill Ferrant needs to, uh, you know, it, the tax advantages are such or the offer is such that they're going to uh, do a disposition of a portfolio in a certain market, they have to think if my portfolio is 3D printed, is it sellable on the retail market? You know, will it appraise? Will there be enough comps? Maybe there will be by 10 years, but right now there wouldn't be enough in a for sale retail environment for these products. Could there be for modular? Likely for modular just because it's built so prescriptively to the existing uh, IBC. But that, that's just something that folks have to think about um, when they're choosing a mode in which to build. Some other things to think about is there's, a going, to, there's going to be a huge um, need and you think labor is a problem now and materials pro uh, shortages are a problem now. We see housing starts by to 1.8 million by 2020. And there's a huge under uh, shift underway in housing to support that. But, uh, and, uh, and on top of that, we have these delayed starts from 2021 that are just kind of pushing these different things into different, these different projects in different years. All of these things are going to require some sort of change or this won't get built. And because of the demographics being the way they are, they need to get built. So if they need to get built, there's demand. That means there's going to be yield. That means there's going to be money in the space for it. So just a few things to think about. Um, we share with our build, our single family build for rent and our for sale and apartment uh, and building product manufacturer clients is thinking about the delays in products. Okay, this is how we think about uh, the delay probability curve and the products we recommend folks basically stock up on or make sure they have good relationships in these. And there's a lot of thought that goes into the vulnerabilities, including, you know, how many times things have to cross uh, international borders or do they depend on uh, open water uh, container ships? Uh, what, what is the likelihood of the supply chain of those products? And so uh, that's what goes into this index. And so as we think about um, the, building these products, we have to think about labor in the field. We have to think about labor in the mills and in the woods and in the mines and everything in between. And that's what we put into this uh, really thoughtful chart that Todd Tomlack and Steve Baston put together. So, uh, and, and what we've seen actually is more of the single family build for an apartment builders and developers stock up on these products and warehouse them than the for sale ones, but we're actually seeing it more uh, increase across uh, both those, um, both of them. You can see these bottom ones, these are the most complex. So th this is, these are the sort of things that could keep uh, completions from happening, even if starts do. So uh, things we have to keep in mind as we're planning out the years, but they're also catalysts for innovation, for adoption. And so we want to think about that. Uh, there are a lot of, we talked about the, the path to market. That's, those are the kind of nuts and bolts of the things that have to happen for materials to get somewhere for these products. It doesn't matter if it's modular or 3D or mass timber or traditional stick frame or panelized or turnkey. None of that matters uh, uh, compared to the people on this screen. These are, these are the people that have to roll up their sleeves and work together to make these things come together. That's why there's so much focus on vertical integration and teams now. Super subs, yes, but really, who are the people we're investing in is what the builder and developer is looking at you know, in terms of trade partners. And the trade partners are, are rightly looking at the builders and making sure that communication is happening. And the one jobs where the communication is happening, regardless of the mode of, of construction, those are the projects that are getting done. The best, selling the fastest, closing the fastest, renting, leasing up the fastest um, for the best rates. So that's something we can't take this human element out, but we can do a few things. When we think of innovation, we, th we often see things happening slowly, then all at once. And we look at this chart here where it shows how different technologies, electronics were adopted over the years. And uh, you can see some of it took a while, but then as we get to towards 2019, we see the tablet computer just basically go vertical. 
And if you haven't read the book, um, The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth, strongly recommend that. He comes from the building products. We're really talking about how, te how technology is deflationary and how it's uh, going to uh, cap uh, catapult and speed adoption of these different uh, technologies. And so we saw it happen with smart home tech. What really was the catalyst for that all to come together and be more viable for huge communities um, all over? Now we're seeing very integrated communities across the country. Well, the products themselves had to integrate. So there's one hub for everything. So for building systems technology, what had to happen all of these products, you know, Sears Modern Home, Google Lambs, Manufactured Homes, Prefab Trusses, iJoyce, Modular Homes. Well, what really makes all that come together to speed adoption and go more vertical into that early majority is the integration that uh, teams can put together. How can they vertically integrate? How can they self-perform more? And that's why you see builders and build for rent operators buying modular factories and setting up their own operations. And, you know, they're doing, doing a little bit of what Katero was doing, but they're just doing it more staged, more planned, more strategically, and at a slower and smaller scale so that it can be proven out and uh, not um, have issues long term. So a couple of things we ask in our builder survey, and I just want to talk about why communication is so important. We asked dealers uh, if their builders were thinking about any of these. Are they talking to them about prefabricated products? And by and large, they say their builders weren't really considering much outside of roof trusses, which had roughly 100% market share. Well, that's understandable. So this is the lumber yard supply chain telling us that the builders aren't really considering these things. But what did the builders say that same month in the builder survey we did? They said they're researching all these things or they're already using and very few of them are not considering these technologies. So there is a disconnect just in that little from the builder to the dealer. They deal with each other all the time. If they're not communicating with each other enough to convey the same picture, then think of how many layers above and upstream and downstream that aren't communicating. And that's why having specialists at each of these levels in offsite construction and build for rent um, is so important. So keep that communication going. So in August, we had our uh, webinar for New Home Trends uh, clients on offsite. So we had um, we had Oakwood, we had Integra, we had Van Meter, and we had Mighty Buildings. And the takeaways from that, the big takeaway was that they're doing more self-perform, more vertical integration. And the catalyst for something working or not working in different markets, depending on the product and so forth, Code, credibility, competition, and constraints being labor materials. So those four C's, or I guess five, I can't listen there, um, were, were kind of toggles whether it was going to work for that particular project. So those are all the things we encourage uh, all of our clients and, uh, and folks that we get to visit with to consider when they're thinking of these technologies. And, but over time, people say, building product manufacturers especially say, hey, is, is 3D printing going to displace my business? And, and my answer to them is probably, but it, you got time to adjust. So adjust. And so that's our message is um, these things typically do get adopted over time. So uh, the, and, and most of the times they just don't go away. Very few times do they just completely fail and disappear. So it's important to consider these um, when you're considering your business. So we think about the, the uh, catalysts, you know, for EWP, for example, you know, what made EWP really take off? What is going to make bill for rent take off? And then what could potentially make, say, 3D take off or modular or whatever it is? Um, whenever you're working with your product or service, we have to think about what are the catalysts to adoption? for that segment or your business or your clients even. So here are some, just some uh, interesting things that are happening. Now, all of these are on the radar of every build for rent operator we're talking to. So um, here's a company in Durango, Colorado. They're doing mass timber, um, basically local mass timber for local projects, bamboo mass timber, um, 3D printed homes and mass timber. We asked dealers if their customers are considering or asking about it. Some of them did say that they were. 
So we, had, we should consider what would supply chains look like in five years? What do they look like for for sale product? What do they look like for apartments? What do they look like for built for rent? What do they look like if someone just comes in and they own the entire value chain? And could it happen? It actually already is happening, just not in this country at scale. Japan, Northern Europe, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, there you you have developers that develop, they they buy the land, they develop it, they uh, build a factory, sometimes they'll build a factory on site or rent something nearby, or they have a factory that they can ship from. They own the lumber yard, they make the windows, they do all these things, and they keep the buildings, they rent them out, and then they sell them after time, or they sell them on completion. They own that whole process. That doesn't happen in the United States, but it could. There's more dollars to think about coming into, into build for rent. There's tons of institutional money coming into this space. It's searching for yield and it's finding it and it's really happy right now. So we need to think about that. I, got, I remember I mentioned the $4 billion Lennar uh, raise with Centerbridge. That is just a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the deal flow out there. So it's, it sounds rosy. It sounds like this amazing you know, opportunity for everybody. It's likely not going away. We likely also won't keep seeing the growth that we have seen in rents and community counts and so forth. But we see steady use of this strategy um, over the years coming to help uh, uh, the housing issue, to offer a product to the right demographic that we saw earlier, and uh, that will also offer some diversity in portfolios. So all of those things speak to something really sustainable. So Matt, we talked about bill for rent, 10, sometimes some, some performers are gonna have a 30 year time horizon. It's not dependent on normal capital. It's not dependent on appraisal comps, strong demand for environmental social governance strategy that is actually being enacted. So you can imagine a world where, say, you had 3D and mass timber, or you had mass timber modular, or you had a 3D mass timber and modular together with um, a power station and geothermal or solar thermal. All these strategies could be used and are on the table for these portfolios that could be in someone's book of business for a long, long time, much different than the for sale space. And so that's how we think about uh, building materials, building products, channel, the uh, different building technologies, single family build for rent apartment, uh, multifamily, and uh, for sale as the remodel business, because we see that um, being a really interesting space for some of the pod uh, manufacturers. So that is, uh, I think we have some time for questions or however the, the setup is, but I want to see if anyone had any um, thing they wanted to talk about in relation to what we shared today. Here's my contact information and then also the John Burns team that really is the, is the specialist team for the earnings calls and the research and the analysis, putting a lot of these slides together. Um, happy to connect with you or connect any of you with them. Well, wow, that was awesome, Tim. Like amazing. Uh, it's it's never there's never a shortage of information for you. I'm going to open it up. I know we've got some amazing people on this um, on this call or this event. Please, uh, if you have some questions, go for it. Lead in. Looks like in the chat. I don't know if there was any questions in there. Yeah, we had one question from Nick. Nick, I don't know if you want to unmute and just ask the question. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, hey, Tim, I was just noticing a lot of the um, sort of areas you showed that were sort of in growth mode weren't necessarily known for like smart cities or smart growth or had robust um, public transportation. I mean, how have you looked at cities like um, San Jose and the Bay Area that are, are looking at rezoning to densify their areas, um, you know, as part of a rent um, base, you know, looking at taking like Berkeley just recently um, got rid of single family zoning and they're looking at adding fourplexes on single family lots. Like, have you guys looked into that as part of a smart growth um, process? Yeah, you know where that 
gets the most legs is sort of like what they're doing in Oregon or Portland, especially is uh, changing their parking requirements for those uh, from being kind of your multifamily parking requirement to uh, being something more like a, a house hacking situation. And while I'm hoping that more, uh, more and more house hackers do go out and buy those as a, a wealth generation um, uh, vehicle, the, the uh, fact is that, that institutional money is looking at the space, which does speed things along uh, and grease the wheels a lot. They have great attorneys that work through kind of getting those projects uh, approved and um, entitled and, you know, rezoned or um, any kind of, uh, you know, changes that need to be made. So uh, we haven't done a ton of studies on that, but we have been watching the zoning changes and we have heard about the money going into those uh, places. The biggest ones being um, NorCal, like you said, and um, Oregon, Seattle is looking at the same thing, although it's not approved, Minneapolis, parts of Mass Massachusetts and um, Florida. And um, I think that it's a really important piece that not enough people are talking about, but we haven't seen enough movement to really track. Great, great. But it's funny, you, you really hit the nail on the head with that answer. <laughs> it does revolve around parking. You know, parking is a direct correlation to density. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, I didn't think it was that big of a deal until six or seven years ago when I had friends going through it with their apartment building in, in Portland. But there's actually a, some really, it's really a uh, really long read, but there's some really great um, precedent set in by the city of Portland that a lot of cities are watching closely with the uh, parking requirement changes. Uh, I think you can pretty much Google Portland, city of Portland uh, parking requirements reform and find the uh, find the document. Okay. Great question, Nick. I love it. Um, I love your idea. The price of tomorrow. John Booth was that the book that you said that we? Oh yeah, Jeff about? Booth. Yeah, Jeff Booth used to own. Uh, he was the CEO of Build Direct, um, which was a, a direct fulfillment for sampling of building materials. Great book. Good listen to. Yeah, I'm going to definitely get it. I, I appreciate that. I love um, the breakouts of all the different areas of how this is affecting us. Um, I love the area that you had with obviously modular. I think that's a really interesting discussion and in how it's on this rise. And then obviously labor being um, another cause of that. Do you have a division that's just handling like just assets of modular? Because you know, um, Tim, as well as I do and Nick and everybody else that's on the call, um, you know, it's, it's like we're the um, pioneers into opening up this space and having these discussions. So are you, are you having a team that is developed just strictly in that space and doing more research in that area? Yeah, so um, the great thing about the, our business is set up for both research and consulting. So we have our off the shelf research like that has really been fleshed out um, since, you know, 2010. For a single family bill for rent, along with all our other uh, research. Um, and uh, how that started was with some custom consulting projects. Well, that's how I'm working uh, in at John Burns to build a small part of the practice around modular offsite because we've now gotten several uh, consulting studies that outline basically um, how uh, help us think through how folks should be planning for the next 20 years. So we don't have anything off the shelf uh, for offsite, but we do plan to next year. Yeah, I, def I definitely think that would be a great space because you know, as well as I, I do and, and Tim and, um, and Nick as well, Nick Gomez um, and even Scott, it's interesting because that's one of the areas that we get asked about more and more. And it's, you know, there's, there's only a couple of people that I can kind of direct them to. So it's kind of nice to see that you guys are expanding in that and especially you growing in that area. 
Um, this has been amazing. Is there any other questions that anybody else may have? I'm just looking in the um, chat because I got to get my glasses. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, Tim. It's Chris Blanchard. Hey, Chris. Hey, um, it's funny that um, you're talking about job postings uh, for BFR. I started the day uh, on the phone with um, Joe at Amherst. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and so those guys are, you know, for Amherst, they've got five or six locations where they own lots of land and lots. And, you know, their solution is to put up factories in each one of those places. Um, and just kind of concurrently, um, the Boise Valley now has uh, Lennar, KB, Shea, and Toll. And, uh, you know, my cousin is running the uh, Shea project out there. It's going to be 975 homes uh, over the next eight to 10 years. And I just said to him, I said, how, you know, how on earth do you plan to do that? And he said, you know, the only way we can possibly do this is through panelization or mm -hmm. you know, modularization. And so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what, what do you see as potential business models or cooperation or coopetition amongst these builders to get some of their problems solved uh, along labor shortages and, and just the, the need to ramp up to meet um, all the demand and to get homes on their lots. Yeah, we've seen um, the, the market is, is really, has really too many layers and is really kind of fractured. Um, but what's can't come out of that is these, these fractional relationships, like you said, they uh, cooperate, well, how do you say it? Uh, co uh, cooperative competition or something like that. Yeah, yeah. co-opetition. Yeah. Co-opetition. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Uh, I think I ha I've heard that before. Uh, maybe it was from you. Um, so uh, we're seeing more and more of that, as you saw in some of those slides. And uh, some of that has to do with, uh, you know, capital stack of joint ventures and and just the not enough uh, of the right dirt out there. But uh, the bet the I, I look at as an analog in the United States, maybe Oakwood or Van Meter. And the reason I say that is because um, they're doing stuff in-house and they're not, especially Van Meter, they're not particularly married to a mega panel or uh, a modular or a bathroom pod. They kind of uh, are looking at all the technologies and that's where things have been successful over, um, over the years is uh, in these other countries is the adoption of multiple modalities depending on the project. And so one project panelization might, uh, open panels might be the best um, prefab on site. You might have one where cold form steel is better prefab on site. I mean, it, but, or you might have a modular situation um, that makes a lot more sense. It just, it should depend on the project, not particularly be married to volumetric or, or, um, you know, a mega wall strategy. And that's where we're starting to see developers considering um, those kind of things. Although I know the modular factories would love a pipeline of, you know, one project for years and years um, that, that doesn't, it doesn't work for every, you know, every project and it doesn't work for every underwriting and pricing either. Well, thanks for that insight. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's good to good to hear your voice on here. Are there any other questions? He's, this is a great topic, and it's great information to be able to have the research that backs what's happening um, over the, even the last five years. It's amazing, Tim. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for your thank insight. You. Um, it's been a pleasure having you as always. Um, thank you everyone else for watching and participating. I love when I get other people that are in the industry and maybe not even in the industry are thinking about getting into some kind of offsite solution. I think there's many and I agree with you, Tim. I think that not every project is modular, not every project is panelized, but there's a solution if um, you're willing to look at it and get some research. So it's great to know that John